Good evening, one and all. Thank you for those of you who are here and those of you who are watching at home. We welcome you to our uh, Founders Forum this evening. It is May 22nd, 2009. My name is Aaron Baker. I'm the uh, city staff representative to the uh, Historical Committee. We have a wonderful program for you tonight. There are going to be lots of laughs and lots of good stories. Um, our guests this evening are Carol Woods and Jimmy Hughes. And uh, I've been told, no, I, I can't guarantee this, but I've been told I need to put a disclaimer on the beginning of this program that maybe all things presented in this program tonight are not factual, <laughs> <laughs> but they are a good story. That's what I've been told. So I, I can't say whether or not that's the case. So also this evening, we, uh, we had a, as part of Mesquite Days 2009, we had a, an essay, poetry, and art contest. And we have our winners here this evening. Uh, they worked very hard and did some wonderful things. The winners of the essay and poetry portions will be able to read their essays this evening or poems to you. And the art is available on display out in the uh, mezzanine area. And it will also be on display this whole week here at City Hall. So if you're watching from home and you'd like to be able to see it, you can come down and look at it there. So. Without uh, further ado, we will have Marianne Levitt come up, and she will present our awards to our winners in the community division and the high school division. Probably so they can go home. First of all, I'd like um, all the people who entered the contest who are here, if you could stand, just so that we can see these great people that entered. I don't know if we can hand back. Thank you. We had some great entries. The poetry and the essays were really fun to read, and the artwork was just beautiful. Um, for the community, we had, for our first place winner, we had a poem called Dance of the Tumbleweeds by Diana Siracle. And if she would like to come up, we will. Her award. We're going to have the that read after we do all of our presentations. Okay, so first of all, you get this lovely check. <laughs> and a congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. I literally. Oh, sorry. Well, so easy. You get to keep that. Oh, we get to keep it. Sorry, really fast. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, for our community best of show, we had a beautiful painting um, of the Virgin River. And then she also wrote a poem that went along with it. Um, and that was Diana. Oh, sorry. Mary Daigle. Sorry. And then for our high school entries, we had the first place art was a piece by Tiffany Kelly. And she gets a $50 savings bond as well as this lovely Um, our first place essay was by Aaron Rapley, and he, I don't think he's made it yet. So, And then our best of show for the high school was Jennifer Mendez, and she did a lovely pencil sketch. You need to go look at it. And she gets a we as well as her plaque. Um, do you 
want to do that? Thank you, Marianne. Congratulations uh, to the winners. They were, they were wonderful. Um, as well, I wanted to uh, note that the prizes were donated uh, by the City of Mesquite and also by the Bank of Nevada here in town, Dan Wrights, the president of there. He was very generous and kind. So could we have a round of applause for them as well? All right, as I mentioned earlier, this evening's program is uh, Jimmy Hughes and Kara Woods. Our moderator this evening is David Bly. It should be very interesting. Oh, thank you. Marianne just reminded me, we need to have the winners read their essays. Before we get into that, but let me just say, we'll have them jump in after they finish reading, and I think David will do the introductions on them as well. So if we could have Mary Daigle, we'll have you come up first, and then Diana, we'll have you come up after that. This is the voice of the Virgin River. I am the Virgin River. For many thousands of years, I have worked my way through towering red mountains and forested green hill. <clears throat> yes, I have created the valleys, watched the dinosaurs disappear, quenched the thirst of pioneers, provided water for their crops, and beauty for their soul. Today I meander quietly, rippling over stones worn smooth. Tomorrow I come with a mighty rush, my power more than man's creations. Yet you build again. You brave and hardy people, you continue to settle this valley majesty of mountains, coolness of water, inspiring visions for future dreams in this, in this town now called Mesquite. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to, I wrote this poem called Dance of the Tumbleweeds, and I wanted to just give you a little background if I could. It won't take very long. Um, I had gone down to Laughlin in the Christmas of 2007 to visit my daughter. And if you remember, for those of you who've been here a while, 2007, it was almost New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, and we had that horrendous wind that was blowing so hard, like 70, 80 miles an hour. And I had to drive back and then I kept waiting for the wind to catch my little car and send it off flying into the air. But I noticed that all these tumbleweeds were coming across the highway and they were all going the same direction. And so I got this little bizarre idea. So <laughs> that's what I wrote the poem about. <clears throat> There is a legend told in the West, a legend of the dance of the tumbleweeds. Storytellers whisper there is a valley never seen by man, a valley deep in the desert where the four corners of the wind come to celebrate the dance of the tumbleweeds, young and old. The four winds blow the tumbleweeds from their home in the far reaches of the desert, young and old. And while these four winds celebrate in this, this secret valley, the tumbleweeds dance, young and old. They dance filled with the joy of flight, with the joy of freedom, with the joy of homecoming. They dance separately and with each other until nothing is left of the young and old. When the winds have finished the celebration, they sigh as they depart the secret place, leaving silence behind 
and the debris of broken tumbleweeds. The dance of the tumbleweeds is ended for young and old. People will say, have you noticed? There haven't been any tumbleweeds lately. But the winds whistle and secretly laugh and prepare for the next dance of the tumbleweeds. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, be here tonight to talk to Jimmy and Carol about the uh, incorporation of Mesquite as a city uh, 25 years ago. But before we get into that, let's, uh, let's uh, get a little history. And since Jimmy looks like he'd know a lot more history than Carol, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's start that. Would, would you tell us a bit about growing up in Mesquite, what it was like, what the town was like, how you stayed out of trouble and things like that? First, first of all, I want to make sure that <clears throat> everyone knows the reason I'm here is to keep Carol's from telling them big whoppers. So, <laughs> uh, my great granddaddy was born when was one of the fourth white baby or fourth babies born in this valley, and we've been here for four or five generations. Uh, seen a lot of changes in my life. Um, I remember where we're sitting right now it used to be my granddad's motel. He had the huge motel and across the street was my father's service station and my uncle Silv's garage. He was an implement dealer, a John Deere dealer. And uh, where the uh, casino is or the, the little um, Golden West uh, casino, that was the first store in this valley and that belonged to my grand great granddad who uh, I'm proud to say I was named after Jimmy Hughes, and uh, his, his name was James Elmer, but they called him Jimmy. Uh, me and my wife, we've been here all uh, ever since we were married. Uh, I tell everybody that we've been just too broke to leave, so we've been here for a long time. Seen a lot of changes, uh, some good, some bad, but for the most part, it's it's a plus. And, um, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to live here in my life. It's been a wonderful experience. Kara? Is this on? Carol, can you uh, tell us? Uh, you weren't born here, but arrived here at a fairly young age, correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I was born in uh, Payson, raised in Salem, Utah and moved to Lander, Wyoming for a couple of years, then moved here. I moved here about a month after I turned 15. I was a freshman in high school and um, moved from a population of about 20,000 people nestled up in a really cold area. Of, um, in fact, I saw the temperature at about a minus 40 to a um, hot desert, but we did move here in November, so it was a couple of months before we got a taste of the real heat. But when I moved here, um, all of the, um, from K through 12 was under one roof. And the high school was doing a, a musical production of Oklahoma. And I thought I was in heaven. My sister and I got to go and watch him perform and um, fell in love with everybody. It was just wonderful. and. Um, Everybody was very um, outgoing and welcomed us. Of course, we were the new kids on the block. And so we, uh, we was looked at a lot. We was kind of under the microscope. In fact, uh, we had Thanksgiving in my aunt and uncle's house. In fact, we had no place to live when we moved here, so we lived with them. Um, they had a large family. That is um, Blaine Allen and Eva Allen. They had a large family, and I come from a family of nine. So here we are smashed in this little tiny house having Thanksgiving, but I was in the kitchen doing the dishes. And I have a cousin, Robert Allen, that is my age. He was a, a class above me, but he's still my age. And he was sneaking people up on the porch looking through the window to see his cousins doing the dishes. <laughs> so we was quite a novelty when we moved here. 
probably you didn't have television then. Was that the problem? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we had television then. We just didn't watch it. <laughs> but for entertainment, um, there really wasn't much. We had to create our own entertainment. There was uh, a lot of snake dances. We would snake dance down the middle of the highway, which was the main road, um, Mesquite Boulevard, which was the main road that went through. And um, if we left school, we couldn't go anywhere because there was no place to go. It was either at Bondis Cafe or the Face Cafe. Um, I see a lot of faces out there that could tell some stories. <laughs> and maybe it's a good thing they can't. Uh, Jimmy, when, when you were young, a little younger than you are now, um, what are some of the things you did for entertainment? Well, some of them I can't talk about, but uh, <laughs> we, we made our own, uh, you know. I remember in high school, you know, we'd get in the back of an old pickup, a bunch of us, and we'd take our guns, and, and the girls would get in, and we'd have some, some um, cool chests there, and we'd go to the mountain, and we'd shoot rabbits and quail, and when we got up to White Rock, we'd have a big Dutch oven uh, rabbit and quail fry. Uh, we... We thought it was uh, just absolutely marvelous when we could get Dutch and Ethel, Ethel Levitt from Bunkerville to, they, he played the saxophone and she played the piano, and boy, they could play, and um, still some of the best music I've ever heard, and uh, we learned to dance, so we, they turned the gyms over to us. We just made our own, we swam in the ditch, uh, we just had a ball. Uh, it, you know, some of these kids now, the only thing they can do is this, uh, you know, and, uh, we made our own entertainment. So you don't feel you were deprived of anything? Uh, no, I surely wasn't. <laughs> did, did, did anything happen on Halloween that you can talk about? Well, I, I remember there was this girl, and she was scared to death of uh, the graveyard. And being Halloween, we thought it'd be fun, so we took her up to the graveyard and we tied her to a headstone. <laughs> And then drove off and left her. Well, we thought it was funny, so we just drove around, and when we come back, she's passed out. And we thought we'd killed her. So it wasn't as funny as we thought it was, but it's funny now. <laughs> when uh, Mesquite was on the highway, the highway between Salt Lake and Las Vegas, did you get characters coming through? Oh, we, we did. And my uncle Oscar Abbott, he was, uh, he was the sheriff here for... I don't know how long, Carol, 20, 30 years. They called him Old Eagle Eye because he sat right over here on the corner by Vonda's Cafe. And every car that come by that looked a little suspicious, he would pull them over. And, you know, he got a citation from the FBI that he caught more stolen cars, one policeman, <laughs> than any department in the United States. And I thought, <laughs> so characters, yeah, we had all kinds come through here. There were some even living here. <laughs> When uh, he, he was the law here then, one, one he, person. He was the law. And I read, you talked about Halloween. I remember one Halloween, we got an old outhouse, and we painted it up as the sheriff's office, and we put it over on the corner. And he didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, what, what was the... Uh, you were part of the county at the time. Uh, was there other than the sheriff? He he was officialdom in the in the town, was he not? He was. Did he do more than just law enforcement? Was he? No. Uh, at, at that time, uh, the the town was was small enough that we were all kind of related, and we knew everyone. Everyone knew their neighbor. So, you know, if there was a problem, it is either he had arrested them. Or if there's another kind of problem, the bishop talked to him. So that, that, that was about the two problems we had in town. Did people look after each other's kids? I mean, you could get into trouble with any adult, whether it was your parent or not. Is that, and, is that and how it was? And you know what? I got my butt kicked several times by the neighbors and by my uncles and everybody else. I don't know what for, but, but I did. Com completely unjustified, I yeah, suppose. completely unjustified. <laughs> is this ringing true, Carol? It was a little bit before your time, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a little bit before, but not much, because yeah. if you did get in trouble in Mesquite, your parents knew before you got home what had happened. 
and you knew you was in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes you just kind of delay going home a little bit. <laughs> Uh, if you got into trouble at school, you uh, didn't go home and complain to your parents, did you? Or? Uh, no, they already knew about it. My, <laughs> <laughs> my father was a counselor at school, so I, I couldn't get away with much, and my uncle was the principal. A theory of relativity means something different in Mesquite, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> uh, Jimmy, did you have to be careful who you dated? Well... Did I, is this on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't have many girlfriends. I, I don't know why. I was so good looking and uh, handsome and charming, <laughs> but uh, I think it was my attitude. I had this redneck attitude, and we, there was a group of us, we just had a lot of fun. And girls, uh, they were kind of holding us back. You know, was, <laughs> and, and what were the chances you would have been dating your cousin? Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Now I, I have my I have my daughter sitting here, and she married Levitt from Bunkerville, and their paths cross five times. Is that right? Four or five times, and in, in, so we're pretty well inbred. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did. Uh, what, what was a big outing? I mean, you, you, we were what we would call fairly isolated here. Was it a big trip to go to St. George or to Vegas? Carol, what, uh, what do you remember about that? We wanted to see a, a movie. That's where you had to go. If you needed to do some serious shopping, that's where you needed to go. There was only one store here. It was a little variety store and a grocery store. It was J.L. Bowler's department store. That was, that was it. Um, and we just, like Jimmy said, we just pretty much made up our, our own fun, and a lot of it we can't talk about. <laughs> I, I think that's where Walmart got its uh, start, is looking at J.L. Bowler's store, because <laughs> he, he carried about everything that Walmart carries. <laughs> Maybe not quite the quantity, but he carried about everything. And uh, I, I imagine he gave a lot of credit? He did. He was a very generous person, and uh, yes. All of the business people at that time. I remember Faye's Cafe and Vonda's Cafe. You could take 25 cents or 35 cents over and get a big old hamburger and a big scoop of mashed potatoes and gravy or French fries and a, a Coke or, or probably wasn't a Coke. Root beer was, uh, uh, you know, 10 cents. It was great. That's and, great. Okay, now let's. Um, <clears throat> you after high school, Jimmy, tell us what where you went, what you did. Well, I, I tried to evade the bishop for a couple of years, and he finally caught me, and, and they sent me to Germany on a mission for the church. Uh, they sent me to Salt Lake for three days to teach me how to brush my teeth and shine my shoes. And when I got off the plane in Hamburg, I didn't know whether somebody was speaking to me or clearing her throat. But I was over there for about uh, 31 months. That was when they... The church now is two years when they send you on a mission. That was, they give you six months to learn the language. And after I returned home, I went to BYU and to finish my education and um, met my darling. Probably the best thing that ever happened to me. You, you had some opportunities after university that might have taken you away is that right I, I did i had a couple of job offers i i was an old country boy and i could judge a pig or a horse or a cow pretty good so i had a chance to go down to san diego to, to be an appraiser for a bank you know for their agricultural end of things or i had a chance to go to uh, omaha to buy hogs for hormel but my dad had a little service station right straight across the street and he kind of talked to me and said he sure needed some help. So I become the most educated gas jockey in town. <laughs> and so I, I stayed here in the gas station for a few years. And uh, then we, we kind of parlayed that in pretty quick. We had three of them and some other things. And so it was a good move. How many people went away for post-secondary education? Was that a fairly high? Did, was that expected? Uh, my graduating class is 17 real bright students. 
and uh, I don't know how many. That, that included you, I. Well, no, that's <laughs> sixteen and me. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think more than half of them went away for education. Yeah. Well, what was your experience, Carol? What what was your graduating class? How big was that? It was one of the biggest. It was um, a class of thirty-eight, and um, I would say at least ninety percent left Mesquite <laughs> to get an education, to, um, to work outside. Um, and I think we've had class reunions uh, pretty regular, and, uh, and I'm, I'm amazed at uh, how well they fit. <laughs> that, that's quite something for a town that size, I, I would think, to have that degree of interest in education. Right. Yeah. Now tell us, after high school, Carol, you I stayed here and worked in the cafes, uh, Vonda, Vonda's Cafe, Blue Duck Cafe, Freezer Cafe, for a year while um, my Tubi husband uh, went to college. He went to um, Logan, Utah State University. And uh, a year later, I graduated in 67. Uh, we were married in 68, had a baby in 69, hmm. <laughs> which kept me busy. And two years later, had another one. And by then, uh, my husband was ready to graduate. Uh, At television? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> and he accepted a job in Eureka, Nevada, which is a ghost town, was a ghost town, is a ghost town. And it was very interesting. Um, and he only stayed there a couple of years. It was a brand new school, beautiful school, but they still lived in the Old West. And uh, we actually had to keep guns in our house to feel safe. So <laughs> it was quite an experience. But uh, he decided teaching wasn't really uh, what he wanted. And so we moved back here. Good. And that's where we stayed. You mentioned feeling safe. Uh, growing up in Mesquite, did you feel safe, Jimmy? Yes, absolutely. Did anyone, uh, now some people say uh, they lived in a town where they didn't have to lock their doors. Did anyone's doors have locks? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Not that I know of. Every neighbor kid felt like down the street was their home was about as much as the next one. So we just, uh, yeah, it was it was a great place to grow. We le I was the last graduating class uh, in the old school in Bunkerville. That oh. was in 1958, and then they moved the school over to Mesquite. Bunkerville's still mad at us. <laughs> You don't want to start a war here. You should be careful. <laughs> well, uh, you saw me look at Marianne, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. What, were you one of those, well, no, there were people who, who, who would hunt to, and I heard stories of people going hunting to and from going to school. They take, take a gun to school. Is that, uh, is that something just? They've changed the laws since uh, <laughs> back then, you know. Yes, we did. Uh, that and, was a field Trip sometimes in the ag departments to go on a hunting trip. It, you know, they've got real crazy about these gun laws. But they still have guns in some schools. Yeah. <laughs> Just, <laughs> okay. What, what ran Mesquite by the time? We're up to, up to the 70s now, early 70s. Who, who, who ran Mesquite? That, that was the town advisory board when, where back in the early 1900s, was there not? And that, and that advised the county on, the, on things? Yes, um, Carol, you, we, we didn't have a lot of uh, wherewith with the county. They, they treated us like, uh, you know, we'd ask for a steak, they'd give us a bone, or, you know, so that led up and that caused feelings for a lot of, a lot of years. That was one of the reasons why we- What, what was the phrase you used, how they treated you like a- <laughs> I, you know, redheaded. Uh, my my wife says I don't know whether you're gonna have the county mad at you, or the polygamists mad at you, or the redheads mad at you. I, I <laughs> the, the phrase that I used was they treated us like the redheaded stepchild of the third wife. And so <laughs> that's, but it might not have been quite that bad. <laughs> um, the, the, the structure then, Carol. There was a building just across the store, practically on this property, was there not? Tell us what was there. Right, right on the corner uh, where the parking lot is was the community center. And it was a cinder block building where everything happened. <laughs> um, it housed um, 
the Mesquite Farmstead Water Association, the power company, the uh, town advisory board, the library, <laughs> I see Geraldine Library, uh, the jail, the police department, um, senior center, the clinic, uh, chamber of commerce, uh, TV association. It was everything. And it was convenient because everybody just came to one office to pay their bills and complain because they had to pay one dollar for television. <laughs> and you say a television association. Obviously, somebody you paid to have a repeater that brought television service here. Was that it? Right. Yeah, and it was tacked on to their water, and they didn't like that. Oh. Dollar a month, wasn't it? Dollar a month. The only thing that wasn't here, I believe, was the telephone company, and it was just across the street. Yeah. And television, what did you get? The uh, Las Vegas stations, or...? Most of it was the Weather Channel, just snowy. <laughs> <laughs> Closest you got to snow, was it? <laughs> well, you, it was a real treat just to try to figure out what program was on. It wasn't real good. Oh, okay. Um, fire Department. Uh, Jimmy, you said you were fire chief at one time. I was, yes. For several years we put on... We had a volunteer fire department here in town, and I'm proud to say that we had a 100% success. Uh, every fire that we went on, we saved the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but we put on, the fire department was all, uh, all volunteer. We put on a, a race called the Desert Olympics. That's back when we were cutting up those Volkswagens and making dune buggies out of them. Everybody had at least one. And so we put on a race up here for just the fire department the first year. The second year we put it on, we had about three times the entries, and uh, they come pretty serious. The third year we put it on, some of those guys showed up in those $30,000, $40,000 race buggies. Uh, they're about half nuts. You know, they'll race for a bottle cap. They just, but we had a lot of fun and brought a lot of business to Mesquite and got a lot of recognition. That was just when we wouldn't put out fire. Yeah. Were there any, any fires of note, anything like the Chicago fire or anything like that? No, we had a, we had a feller over in Bunkerville that climbed up on a haystack and, and burnt the haystack down. They asked him why he did it, and he says, well, he only wanted a little one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you served on the town advisory board for a time as well, did you? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, okay, then if, what what began the drive for incorporation? Carol, you go ahead. You're... Yeah, well, it was like, uh, like Mayor you <clears throat> said, it was the lack of service that we got from the county. And uh, a lot of people, I think the biggest complaint that I remember was building permits, which you had to go to Las Vegas to even start the process. And a lot of people had to go several times to complete the process. And the county, it seemed like the county was wanting them to come back. Maybe they liked us. Maybe they just <laughs> wanted us to keep coming back. But uh, they didn't, maybe they didn't realize, too, that we had to travel, you know, 170, 80 miles um, several times just to finish the process of getting a building permit. And I do remember... Um, before incorporation, the county coming out to even put lights um, in the light poles, we would put an order in, the town board would put an order in, and they would come out, but they didn't have the right bulb, or they didn't have the right ladder, or they didn't have whatever it was they needed, they just didn't have the right stuff. And there was five guys and two pickups, and they'd have to go back and get their stuff, and four or five days later, here they come again. And sometimes they take three or four trips to get one thing done. So it sounds like a make uh, you know should have helped the employment rate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they did. They served us. Um, they was our sanitation system, our maintenance for our parks, our cemetery, um, our streets, our lights. Uh, we pretty much depended on them. And like Jimmy said, they didn't like us very much. So I don't if, think. If maybe not his we're words, you were, enemies, we? <laughs> you were definitely the poor country cousins. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Okay. 
What what uh, what process? What was the point that began that you can remember when uh, the process started for incorporation? Well, after um, after the people got mad enough, uh, they would come to the town board meetings. And I remember one meeting, there was uh, about 25 people <laughs> in attendance. Now that was a huge crowd, and of course all the town board was there, and they talked about incorporation and um, decided at that point that they would pursue um, finding out what it would take. And then I believe it was a couple of meetings later, um, they got more serious about it, and uh, they appointed, I believe it was Harley Levitt, to serve as the chair of a committee to, um, to do what was necessary to, um, to get the paperwork done for incorporation. That, that were was, it, was everyone in favor of it? No. There was some that thought that we would fail, you know, that we were silly, wasting our time. But the majority of the people, of course, was in favor of it. And that's why they, they went ahead with it. You, you mentioned this, someone who went around and did a lot of work. What was her name? Uh, Vilma Davis was, right. a, was appointed. She was on the Chamber of Commerce. And she, she um, spearheaded the committee under the direction of Harley Levitt. And um, she basically did all the footwork and the paperwork. I believe she called a senator to ask uh, exactly what we needed to do to incorporate and was told we could either go through the legislative system or we could go through the courts. And of course, if you go through the legislative system, you've got all this red tape you got and hoops you've got to jump through and money you got to pay for a lobbyist. Well, the city didn't have any, well, it wasn't a city. We didn't have any money. And in order to have money, you'd have to go, the town advisory board would have to go to the county, and they wasn't about to go to the county and ask for money to incorporate, because the county didn't want us to incorporate. Uh, were they caught a little surprised by the, because it happened fairly quickly, did it not, once you made the official application? They was very surprised, not that we didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. I, I know that they were told several times, but they laughed at us. They thought it was impossible that we wasn't strong enough or smart enough or whatever it took to do that. I hadn't been a uh, city or a town in the state of Nevada in the last 40 years that had successfully incorporated. So Las Vegas thought, well, what do they think they're doing? You know, they, they can't make it. It, they'll be crawling back to us in, if they do make it in uh, in six months, but um, we didn't. Um, tell me, uh, you went before a judge then, made the application. Uh, what was his name? He was he was quite helpful, I understand. Hey, Adelaide, judge uh, Adelaide Guy. Yeah, hmm. Judge Guy. And he was a very colorful, uh, colorful character. He. He was, um, I couldn't understand him because he was a, a native of, of some kind, I don't know what nationality he was, but I couldn't understand him and I had to understand him because they appointed me the acting city clerk to get the incorporation done and I had to swear in the, uh, the um, mayor pro tem and, the, and the, uh, the rest of the council and I couldn't understand him when he was <laughs> doing his thing, so that was uh, quite frightening. He came up. He came from Las Vegas up here to do the ceremony. Now, I believe uh, both of you told me about um, when you were going to get the approval in the, was it in the judge's chambers or before, uh, before the judge, the, you called the county and said to get Bruce Woodbury over there, was that? Uh, Bruce helped us out on several occasions. He mm -hmm. was a very, very good politician. And I, and I think uh, he was somewhere else, and you said he'd better get here because. Well, yeah, Bruce and I went back a long way, so we knew each other. And mm -hmm. So, yeah, he got there, and things worked out. And then the work started? Oh, yeah, a lot of work started. Uh, the council had a lot of stuff to do. They had to create a city mm -hmm. uh, from nothing. In fact, uh, the only money that they had was $400 from the filing fees uh, for the first election. And they had to pay for an election. And so they had to um, 
go back to the county and ask for help. Wow. We, we went to the state. Okay. Yeah, we didn't go back to the county. We had too much pride. We went to the state. A couple of us jumped on a plane and went to uh, Carson City and pleaded our case, and they, they approved $50,000 to get us going. And um, it just so happened that uh, when we broke off, the state mandated to the county that we got our share of the, uh, the uh, a piece of the pie. And so uh, the state was on our side, and the county had to give us, I, I don't remember how many thousands of dollars, but it was enough to get us going, and uh, they didn't like it. Uh, I remember uh, they, they, were, they were real upset because we wouldn't give back uh, the two old fire trucks that we had, and we had one old ambulance that run part of the time. And we had a couple of old tractors we used around town, and they were real upset that we wouldn't bring those back to them. And so uh, we had several meetings, and uh, the county attorney, he didn't like me for some reason. And uh, <laughs> he was saying that the citizens of Clark County cannot just give away equipment to Mesquite now that they're not associated with the county anymore that the good people of Clark County had paid for those, that equipment and they wanted it back. Well, anyway, I sat there and I said, well, you know, I paid my taxes and I want my share of this chair and this desk that I'm sitting at down there in Clark County. And he got a little upset. And finally, Bruce Woodbury came over and told me to quit making him mad because I was going to cause him to have a heart attack. And he says, we'll get this worked out, Jimmy. So anyway, he did. And things worked out. And so for a dollar, we got to keep all the old rundown equipment that we had. And, uh, and uh, that's, that started it. Uh, um, <clears throat> then uh, who, who was the first, uh, the mayor pro tem? He was appointed? It was the chair of the board. Which, okay, mm -hmm. and and that was that was Tommy Levin. Right. Okay, and how long did the how long was it until you called an election? A couple of months or? It was uh, July first. Okay, so that was from right. May May to July. So there right. was a lot of work that needed to be done even to get an election um, done. In fact, uh, this is an interesting story for the first election. Um, of course, I was over it, didn't know what I was doing, so I had to depend on the county, which the election department was very good to help us. Um, but we voted with a little box that the county provided for us on a paper ballot that you had to put an X. Now, they had a stamp that had an X already on it. You couldn't make your own X. It was a stamp. You had a stamp on it. And a lot of the people that voted actually took the stamp and made an X with the stamp. <laughs> But uh, you ha <laughs> in the um, the in in counting the ballots, we had to go into our our big boardroom, <laughs> which was a very small room, and as many people as possible fit in there. And we had to open each ballot and determine how they had marked the ballot. And then, with a needle and thread, you had to put that ballot on the needle and thread and thread it and hold on to it. And that it was it was quite strange, but that's the way that we did it, and yeah, that was, was that so someone couldn't slip another ballot in. Or? So, uh, evidently, it was so it wouldn't be counted twice. Or, we, you really yeah. trusted you, didn't they? Yeah, <clears throat> but I that, wasn't even in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was interesting. How uh, how many candidates were there for uh, mayor the first time around? I think there was five. Five or six, five. That's that's pretty good participation. Wow. And and for how big was the council then? There was only three on okay. the council. And were there a number of candidates for those positions as well? I don't remember, but yeah, there were, there was quite a few. I would say at least ten, eight or ten. Was that first election reasonably civilized and congenial, or no? Uh, fights in the streets? No, I or? think everybody knew who they wanted. <laughs> so okay. I don't know. There was, I don't think there was any problem. Okay. And then uh, you began to build a city. 
Yeah, but down. after the election, then uh, Jimmy had to step into his seat and uh, take over, and he did. And we were talking just a little bit before. Um, it took a special person to be the first mayor of Mesquite. Um, it took a person that could stand up against his friends and his neighbors, his relatives, <laughs> and um, and maybe he could scream at them during during the meeting. But after the meeting, they'd be um, shaking hands, and we had some very interesting meetings. <laughs> Everybody was an expert at telling you how to do your job. Well, you know, we was trying to put some rules and regulations in a new city, and everybody wants rules and regulations, but regulate my neighbor. Give my other neighbor some rules. Don't regulate and give me any rules. So <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. Uh, there were some real heated d debates, to say the least. And... Uh, Probably a lot of people, you just leave us alone and let us be what we are. Uh, you know, I think most of the people were so glad to, to break that, that, that bond that we had and get somebody that they could come to. And, and you know, you know, the first, we were everything. We didn't, we didn't have enough money to hire a cop, so we had to go back to the county and, and contract with the county to have a, have a, a policeman. And so we thought, well, they pay those policemen about, what, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year. And so the county said that it was going to cost us, what, 105000 that year for that cop car and that police. Well, that about put us under. And uh, we, we didn't have any animal control. I remember where I lived over there across from the school, there was a neighbor down the street that had a great big old white pig. And every night or every other night, it seemed like that big white pig would get out and go up through the the yards and tip over all the garbage cans. Well, everybody called the mayor, you know, and so one night about 11 o'clock, the, the sheriff pulled up and says, hey, we've got some problems with, with animal in the backyard, so we took his spotlight, and, but when I left, I took my rifle with me, and uh, so, so we found this pig in the back of a neighbor's yard, and so I just took that 270 and, and euthanized it, you know. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> about, about that time, here come the neighbor out in his house coat and his slippers, and he, he said, what's going on? What's going on? He had that flashlight going on, and me and the cop were standing over that pig, and that pig was there just, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I said, oh, we're just doing a little animal control. He looked at me, and he says, a little extreme, isn't it? <laughs> So we had a lot of fun times getting this. Dude, they had a pretty good barbecue after that. I you know, the fellow that owned it, I, I, I had uh, Tobler's Meats was in business there. I, I took the pig down there in the middle of the night and got Glenn out of bed and, and Dale that still worked for the city and, and took the pig down there. I says, now, you, you butcher this pig and take it to the guy that owns it. Well, he did. And he was so mad still, he wouldn't take the meat. <laughs> so we give it to the senior citizens and so. <laughs> but we had, you know, we had some interesting uh, wow. times. What, what, what were some milestones in, in, in the, say, the, the 80s, uh, those first few years? Uh, was there somewhere where you knew suddenly the city was going to grow? Or maybe I could ask you, did you anticipate the growth that came? Not the least. Yeah. yeah. Had this kind of Zionistic look at, look at things. You know, we wanted to keep our green belt here in the valley, and we didn't have, we were landlocked. Everything, everything north of the freeway was BLM. So one of the first things we did is we went to Washington, D.C., and, and uh, we, had, we had some friends. We had... Uh, uh, Laxalt, who was Ronald Reagan's campaign manager, we had Governor Bryan, he's Senator Bryan, we had, still had Harry Reid, and so we had some, we had some friends, and so we told them our plight, and, uh, and be darned if they didn't run a bill through the Congress of the United States for, uh, for us to get this land from the BLM, and so we went back for some hearings, and I went before a congressional hearing to talk about this land, and the BLM, they weren't real tickled to give it up, and 
Fish and Wildlife Service, they weren't glad that we were going to take it. And, but we had done our homework. We had some beautiful aerial, aerial photos. And, and uh, so uh, I was a little concerned, a little nervous. I walked into this hearing, and, uh, and all these senators started coming in, you know. And I didn't know them from any, anybody, but they were all friends of either Laxalt's or Governor Bryan or Senator Bryan's or Harry Reid's or something. And so we had a lot of help. And I'll be darned if, uh, you know, if we didn't... Uh, they didn't approve that, and, and that's what started everything north of the freeway is that, that uh, land act that was run through the Congress of the United States. And uh, that, that kind of opened it up. And uh, as naive as the city council was at that time, we had this plan that, boy, our kids can go up there and they can get a couple acres and uh, they can have a horse and they can raise some chickens and uh, have a cow. And uh, as soon as we got that land, here come the developers. And every one of them was, you know, just like he had walked off of Mount Sinai. He, he, he had it in his hand. He knew what was best for the city. And uh, we had some real struggles, uh, but uh, it didn't work out quite the way we wanted it to uh, with the land. But uh, there's a lot of nice homes up there. Mm -hmm. it turned out to be a beautiful city. So. It was a, very much a learning process, I presume. Absolutely. And uh, when the, the uh, first casino came to town, what in what period was that? Uh, that would have been before the pepper mill, wouldn't it? Uh, oh no, the, uh, the the golden. It, it was a Western Village, I believe. Western Village, but where the state line and and uh, Golden West were they there? Yeah, I think they were. But they, they were always small, but the, yeah. the Western Village was the first big one, wasn't it? The it was here when, uh, when we moved here, and we thought it was wonderful. In fact, that's where we would go. Um, that was the only um, large cafe in town. That's where we would go after our prom, senior ball. That's where our date would take us, mm -hmm. was down there. And anybody that comes through, if you talk to them, they... Old, older people that came through, that was their landmark for Mesquite, was the Western Village. Hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when the, um, the, the freeway came through before incorporation, did it not? Did that hurt the town? Oh, it probably did, you know, I'm sure it did. Uh, or there, there were some benefits and sure. some drawbacks, I presume. Sure. It all it always takes a little business away from from the local businesses, doesn't it? But as you as you look in in town right now on either end, you see the businesses have sprung up, and and mm -hmm. so as a result, I think it's uh, typical. Okay. Uh, how long were you mayor, Jimmy? Way too long, if you talk to some people. <laughs> uh, I was. Uh, the first year, we was kind of on and off year, weren't we, Carol? And uh, didn't right. we run for one year once? Right, right. And two years was the next, and somebody just said I, they didn't want to run. I said, I'll run. It just put me on the two-year deal. And then a four-year. So I was seven years. Mm -hmm. But um, I, my wife threatened to divorce me if I run again. So. <laughs> and... Uh, now, you've been through how many mayors, Carol? Um, I believe um, before I quit, of course we have an election going on right now, but before I quit there was 14 elections. 14 elections. And several mayor and councils and five city managers. So um, I got a good taste of what politics is all about. I was her favorite. <laughs> what do you think uh, if you talk about what do you think about Mesquite now it's a different place than what you grew up, uh, grew up with are there remnants of the old are there improvements do you wish for something else uh, go ahead Jimmy I think there's definitely improvements, you know, if you get sick, you got a doctor, if you need a tooth pulled, you got a dentist, if you need a prescription filled, you got, you got places to go. Uh, 
we have some beautiful ball fields. We have some beautiful rec center. We, there's just, you know, uh, yes, it, it's, it was a learning process, but it was, it was a good learning process. And, and I think uh, those people uh, who have run the city, not myself, but have done a good job. And, and uh, you know, Mesquite's a nice place to live. But you don't live in Mesquite. I don't. You know, I, I told somebody that I screwed the town up so bad that I had to leave town. Hell, I had to leave the state. So I went <laughs> over to my ranch and <laughs> went over to my ranch and built a house. So that's. <laughs> not, but I'm still considered Mesquite home. Right. And uh, your your views on the city as it has grown, Carol? I think uh, the old timers, and I know people don't like to hear that, but would like to have it the way that it used to be. But um, I have to agree with Jimmy, you know, we cried that when we didn't have all those services, we had to go either to Las Vegas or St. George, and uh, now we have them right here at our convenience. It's a good thing. Um, we do miss, you know, the good old days. Mm -hmm. um, but the town has been uh, well thought out, or the city has been well thought out and developed. It's a beautiful place to live. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think we could ask for anything better, really. Thank you. Let, let me just say, you know, to be a public servant, uh, to be in public office, it isn't all what it's cracked up to be. You know, you got half the people mad at you half the time, and the other half the other time, and you have to stand up to your friends and your neighbors and your relatives, and you have to do what you feel in your heart is right. And, and it's a tough deal. So, you know, I take my hat off to these councilmen and these, the mayors. You know, it, it's a thankless job for those people to, to serve like they do. And, uh, you know, in, in every community, it seems like there's somebody out there that doesn't have anything else to do besides gripe and just, just nip at people, you know? They never bring anything to the party. They just, they're just like a pack of coyotes. They just make a lot of noise. And, uh, and you know, and that's been since day one. And, uh, you know, if they'd all take that energy and put it to a positive thing and support the council and support the mayor and the things of the city that they're doing, uh, think where we could be. Uh, it, it, it's just too bad that some people have to have that negative negativism all the time. It's uh, there's there's room for criticism, constructive criticism, I suppose. But uh, well, I got plenty of it. You know, <laughs> I, but uh, yes, there is, and you know, I think it's healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a point though when constructive criticism. Now, my wife, for example, she does not take constructive criticism well at all. <laughs> but but. Uh, but yes, there's a place for it. But you know, it, it's kind of after we, after we say our piece and, and, and we decide we live in a democracy. And after we make that decision, then we ought to support it instead of quit, keep yelping about it. Right. Thank you. Uh, Carol, as a quarter of a century as the city clerk, you had to walk a careful line in politics, did you not? Very careful, very, very careful. I had to sit on the fence. I couldn't go one way or go the other way, but I had to know what was going on on both sides. Um, uh, very hard position um, to fill. The best part of being the city clerk, of course, was um, serving uh, the community and um, trying to, um, to help the council and the mayor to fulfill uh, their wishes. Uh, to try to make the meetings flow as smoothly as possible, which when Jimmy was in was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, one of the meetings, one of the things that the people was, was more upset about after incorporation that comes to my mind was when we started trying to um, do planning and zoning they did not want us to tell them what they what to do with their property or how they could um, that they had to have a sidewalk um, that we had to they had to give give up some of their property to put a road in they no they didn't like that at all but i remember it got quite heated in one of the meetings and uh, uh, one of the the ladies um, stood up and wanted to uh, uh, to throw a motion on the floor of course she couldn't do that she wasn't on the council 
And um, <laughs> Jimmy pretty much put her in her place, and she left, and I don't think she ever came back. <laughs> but they I, were still I good friends. I had that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now, but let me let me say something about Carol. You know, oh, no. with her years of experience, what a great job she did. And not only when I was there, but through the years. And you know, it takes a special kind of lady to to put up with politicians. You know, um, it, it does. It isn't easy. And and she did an outstanding job. So I've heard. <laughs> when you were both younger, when your parents were younger. People grew up in Mesquite and had to leave because there wasn't anything for them to stay here. There was not employment. Um, has that changed? I think you told me, Jimmy, most of your kids live nearby. I have five of my six children live right here in the valley. Yes, they do. Yeah. And we're thankful for that. And yours, Carol, they have? Yeah, I have a couple that are still around. And um, we're glad. <laughs> we're glad there's something for them here. Great. So. I, th I think with the uh, the uh, forward-looking uh, vision that the city has right now with the uh, the expansion of the city property and the technical center and uh, some of these things, you know, things are kind of bad right now, but, you know, it'll come back. I think that's a, that's a great attitude for a city to have that we can, for our children and for our grandchildren. It's, it's just, uh, it's good. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll uh, turn the time back over to Aaron. We would like to thank our, our guests and our moderator this evening for a very entertaining evening. We have some certificates of appreciation for them. If they would like to come down, all of them, we'll present them to them. David, you want to come around? <laughs> I, I know you don't want to be on TV, but <laughs> this certificate is to David Bly. Uh, it reads, in recognition of being the moderator for the Founders Forum, commemorating Mesquite's 25th anniversary on May 22, 2009 with Carol Woods and Jimmy Hughes. Thank you, David. Thank you. You want both come? We've got, we got both of them. We have two certificates, one for Carol and one for Jimmy. It says, in recognition of sharing your uh, life and memories with the citizens of the Virgin Valley at the Founders Forum, commemorating Mesquite's 25th anniversary on May 22nd, 2009. Thank you both. <laughs> Your wife's here, it's all right. <laughs> we got witnesses. All right, well, thank you um, all. Also, I'd like to mention in the morning, we have his, uh, some historical tours here in town. There's a pancake breakfast being put on at the Senior Center. It starts at 8 o'clock. And at 9 o'clock, uh, we will have historical tours starting at 9, 10, 30, and noon. And they'll go from the Senior Center and if you didn't get enough of Jimmy Hughes tonight, you can get some in the morning. He, will, he and his good friend Tuffy Ruth will be telling more truths in the morning. Um, I've, I've been on it. I went last year, and it was a ball. Um, they have a lot of great information, and I think they try to out-tell each other, which is great. It's perfect. Um, but we would certainly like to thank them for sharing, sharing their memories. It means a lot to us, especially hearing about those, those first days and the challenges, certainly they were real and daunting at times. And also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, David for moderating this evening and, and for his efforts he has put in. He's, he's a, a great supporter of history here in the community. And we'd like to thank Reliance Connects and Baja for carrying these proceedings this evening. 
This and past founders forums are available at the museum uh, there on Mesquite Boulevard. The Mesquite Museum is open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So feel free to go in anytime during those times. We've had a lot of fun activities this month, um, the Historical Committee has, and we appreciate those who have participated in those as well. And for those who are here tonight, there are light refreshments available in the foyer. Uh, I do ask uh, that if you are going to eat or drink anything, that you do that outside of the council chambers in the hallway. We have some great art that you can look at there and more opportunity to chat. Thank you and good night.